body diagrams in two dimensions for rigid bodies are really important. They're part of what we use to communicate with each other and they're essential for being able to do equilibrium equations. What are the parts of drawing a free body diagram? There are four basic steps. The first one is to choose your object. Whatever it is, pick it wisely. And we'll talk about what that means. The second thing is to add to your object the applied loads. So whatever you're given in the problem, put them on your free body diagram. The third step is to add reaction loads. A free body diagram is separated away from the rest of the world. So if you have a box sitting on the table, you're going to take the table away and just consider the box. But the table was holding the box up. So we need to replace the table with whatever loads were constraining the object before. Those are reaction loads. And last, you want to add distances, angles, labels, anything that you would need to write equations of equilibrium. So how do you do these reaction loads? Each different kind of worldly constraint puts a different set of loads on your object. For example, a frictionless surface. If you have a coffee cup sitting on a perfectly frictionless surface, what do we put on our object when we take away the world? In this case, you get one reaction load right there that replaces the surface, a normal. And then you have to give it a letter. You get to pick whatever you want to call your reaction loads. The question becomes, how is the surface constraining your box? In this case, the box can't fall through the surface. It's held in place from falling this way. So we need a force in that direction. The box is not held in place from going this way. So we do not need a force in that direction. If it can't move, you get a force. If it can move, you don't. A fixed support, like a stop sign that's stuck in the ground, can be drawn in a bunch of different ways, but the constraint is the same. The stop sign can't move up and down, so I have a reaction load in that direction. It can't move right and left, so I have a reaction load in that direction. And you can't tip it over, so I have a reaction moment in the third direction. Whatever it is, it's a reaction moment as well. A fixed support gives you two forces and a moment. That's the answer to how is the ground constraining the pole. It can't move right and left, it can't move up and down, and it can't rotate. A pin is a slightly different situation. You have a situation here where it can't move up and down, and it can't move right and left, but it can rotate. If you picked up this piece right here and moved it, you could in fact rotate it about the pin. That gives you two forces, but no reaction moment. So then the question becomes, what do you do with things like slots? A slot, this rod right here, my object is this green rod. My green rod can't move perpendicular to the slot, but it can move along the slot. See, a reaction force doesn't have to be in the x and y direction. It can also be in any direction that you're limited from moving. So in this case, what I'm going to have is one force perpendicular to the slot. And this is the same thing if you have a short link or a cable. You get one force in a known direction. That's different from here, where you could replace this with one force at an unknown direction. This is still two unknowns. This is only one unknown, because you know what direction it's in. It has to be perpendicular to the slot. So let's look at this particular example. My object is this rod. It's a beam. I have picked my object. My object is the beam. I have three applied loads here, a 6 newton applied load, a 4 newton meter applied moment, and a 10 newton load at 70 degrees. Those are applied. They're given to you in the problem. I'm going to include those in my free body diagram. I also have here a roller and a pin. 
those are connected to the world. Those I need to take away in order to draw my free body diagram. So, the reaction loads have to be replaced with their appropriate constraints. And then I need to include distances, angles, and labels. So the object comes down, the green piece. The three applied loads come down, as they are. The roller is replaced with a single force. The pin is replaced with two forces here. And then I have to bring down my distances and any angles that I need. Anything I'm going to need to be able to have to do equilibrium. So, in the end of the day, what are you doing? If it can't translate, you get a reaction force. If it can't rotate, you get a reaction moment. When are you finished? You're finished when another engineer who has not seen the problem can come along and write exactly the same equations of equilibrium as you got. Whatever they are, they need to be exactly the same. So the labels you use, for example, need to be the exact labels that you would put in your equations of equilibrium. And last but not least, make sure that you've choose, chosen your object wisely. You're only going to get three equations of equilibrium for a rigid body in two dimensions. So try to pick an object where you only have three unknowns. Thanks.